I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience, but first I want to um, ask a question to Kate, um, and maybe to both of you. Um, Kate, you talked a lot about, obviously, about how Barnes wrote about Matisse. And I'm wondering how much Barnes's writings on Matisse, his opinions on Matisse, how much they influenced our later understandings of him. So, well, in part, that's a topic Claudine took on in her essay, in a way. I mean, you, you talk about, um, in some ways, the reception of, of Matisse. Um, it's a good question, I mean, more than, and in some ways, you know, it's, so um, in, in the essay, there's a little bit of contemporary uh, criticism, uh, discussed contemporary criticism. So Barr, of course, in his 51 book on Matisse, um, is, oh, okay. Uh, I'll try to talk into the mic. So I was saying Barr's 1951 book on Matisse, um, that corresponded to the major exhibition that he did at MoMA um, at the time, he mentions Barnes's book um, and is very complimentary at the same time that he's acknowledging its sort of over-the-top quality of excessive um, description. Um, the, you know, there, there's another critic um, who comes out and says, He's very negative about the book, but he says, oh, it's John Dewey and Leo Stein and Barnes. I mean, there are people who really understand, I think, where it comes from, although they they find it hard going. Um, in some ways, I suppose, I mean, you know, it, for a long time it was it was one of the only books in English on, on Barnes, but I, I don't actually know very well. I mean, do, do people, Alistair, did you read, I mean, as a graduate student, if, if, did you read Barnes and think, I mean? I think I dipped into it very briefly. <laughs> I, I, I had a little book and then that was enough. So I, I, I don't know that the book itself mm -hmm. had that much influence on later understandings. It's, it, it's a good question. And in fact, I would, you know, if, if someone has a better answer from the audience, I take it. But. Um, thank you. Cameron, a question for you. Yeah. Um, I thought it was really interesting, um, your point that um, the mural was not public, of course, yes. and it's the, the sort of ushers in this new period in his work, but nobody really sees it. Yeah. Um, and so this is really, you know, the, this 1936 show is his kind of coming out in this of this new style. Um, and what was my question? Um, now I'm forgetting my question, sorry. Um, oh, I think um, I was wondering uh, two things. Um, I was wondering what you, whether you came across anything that indicated that he was maybe thinking about including some of the studies from the dance in this show. Like, it, did, did he consider that part of this new oeuvre? Um, and then, well, I'll ask my second question in yeah. a minute. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't come across, uh, I mean, I didn't really talk about it. The earliest painting in the show, um, the, the woman in a white dress, which is at the far right end of that long wall, mm -hmm. is like the one easel painting that he kind of had, um, that he kind of worked on towards the end of the dance. So it does seem like he wanted to have, a, like to represent a continuity, <laughs> that the show would be like, what his paintings were from the time of the dance forward. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, he mentions in a letter, another letter to Pierre, that uh, Rosenberg kind of suggested the show to him at the end of 1934, thinking he must have all these paintings stored up from when he was making the dance mural. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, like, he had painted very little. Um, so, in some ways, like this, this show was like a matter of, of like making up for or figuring out what easel painting would be after the dance. Um, and I guess one of the things that, that seems interesting about it to me is that is how, how little it seems like the dance really um, dictated mm -hmm. for him like where he would go. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the things obviously are stylistically very close, but it seems like 
by 1936, he wanted the dance not to represent a style that he was perfecting, but just one of like this kind of kaleidoscope of operations that he would, that he would or could use. I also wanted to ask you to, um, if you had any, I'm sure you did, thoughts about Margaret's talk because um, you know your your talk is about um, this this idea of that that these pictures are a handbook of how to make a Matisse, as you said, yeah. right? So he's reflecting on his own processes and trying to kind of reveal something about them. And yet, I, I don't think that any of these pictures actually show the studio, right? Or well, any of his the methods. One. There's the one. Which is really the, interesting to yeah. me, because early on, he's like showing you all of his material, not materials, but the components of his work. Yeah. And he doesn't do that later. Yeah. I mean, As you know, it's like well, and not in this. It's show, sort of a matter of it's sort of a matter of emphasis. I mean, like a lot of the models are in the studio, but you know, if he crops it tight enough, it becomes a painting of a woman rather than a painting of a studio. Um, but I mean, I think you know, my thought when you bring up uh, Margaret's talk is that you know he was an incredibly self-conscious artist, mm -hmm. like. His investment in understanding his own means mm -hmm. is is kind of breathtaking, and I think, um, you know, it's it's totally revelatory to to uh, hear what he has to say about his own art. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I guess you know, I'm trying not to let him have the last word on it. Like it's just. <laughs> Uh, okay. You know, the, the paintings have to be more than just an illustration of what they were for him. Yes. Um, questions? Yes, please. My question is for Kate Butler. Uh, do you think that Dr. Barnes was greatly influenced by Leo Stein in his artistic taste because uh, Leo Stein's preference was for Renoir, uh, Matisse, and Picasso, and Leo Stein did not like Cubism, and he, uh, he, 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 um, he dismissed Cubism at the same time as he dismissed his sister's um, avant-garde writings, and after 1913, he and Gertrude never spoke again. And, um, it, 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 and, and, I, and, I, and it seems to correspond to, uh, and to a great deal to Dr. Barnes's preferences. Yeah, I would, yes, I would agree. Um, and there's a little bit more of that in my essay. Originally, very early on, I said I would write on Barnes and Leo and get at Matisse that way. Um, and then when you, and in fact, there were whole passages that got junked about them. But when you look at the correspondence between Barnes and Leo, which is big, from 1914 to 25, when they have a kind of breakup over the review of Leo's review of the art and painting, um, there's almost no mention of Matisse in their correspondence. That first letter that I cite, and then in 1921, when he's buying Leo's Matisse's, there's more kind of um, back and forth that's uh, about you know, official business. So it's actually hard to make uh, a specific um, interpretation about them by looking specifically at their correspondence. But I mean, they were sharing their essays back and forth. It's in my essay at this point. I can't quite remember which one. You know, Barnes sends him the Renoir essay, I think, a, a preliminary version. And I mean, there's, a, there's an incredible exchange. Um, and they're very intellectually similar. I, I think a little bit later on, Barnes sends him Dewey's art and appreciation, and he then writes to someone else, and he says he doesn't like Dewey. But um, you know, Leo um, was at Harvard under uh, James, so there's a, there's an enormous um, kind of methodological overlap between the two men. That and and he says that I think it's in um, the first essay, How to Judge a Painting, where he says you know how much. I think it's there. Maybe it's a letter 
Um, but you know, yes, Martha's a, written on it. Um, there's a letter, I think, after Leo dies um, that he writes to Leo's wife um, where, he's, where he talks about how much Leo influenced him and how much he meant to him. And he says, nobody um, had more impact on my early thinking about art than Leo Stein. So yeah, so that's complete you know, intellectual connection that they had. Joe. Evidence that he, Barnes, pursued either Verdure or the ferry boat in Tahiti or the remarkable the studio interior. I um, mean, these, these are masterpieces of their kind, and clearly the. F yeah. Uh, yeah, you should take it. <laughs> <laughs> it's convenient. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Matisse really wanted. Well, first. Um, Comrade, a question. Uh, I think you said there were five paintings that show Tahiti II in the background. Uh -huh. One of them is the a model in the studio painting that was in the Rosenberg show. How many of the other four were in the Rosenberg show? All of those that I All showed. All five of those paintings? Yes. Okay. So the, the missing um, element here is that Tahiti II was a tapestry cartoon. Tahiti I was a tapestry cartoon as well. One was fabricated as a tapestry in a single example, bought by Nelson Rockefeller. And Matisse really wanted Barnes to buy a tapestry from him. And he really hoped that that, that would happen. It never did. Barnes bought tapestries by other artists, but not by Matisse. Tahiti II was never fabricated as a tapestry, never woven. It appears in the background of those paintings because it remained in Matisse's studio. And so I think your idea of the well, it's a kind of, yeah, it's a feedback loop and an adaptive reuse yeah. of a Tahiti, of a tapestry cartoon in the backgrounds of his paintings. He had it around for a long, long time, and it's a presence in his studio for a long time. So I think that's a par partial response to Joe's question and yeah. to the question of why it's there in so many of those paintings. Um, but the interior of the studio, um, that really odd painting, it, it's in a New York private collection. It was, it was sold. Um, I mean, I would think Barnes, you know, given his significance as a collector of Matisse, would have had, uh, you know, priority over choosing works from the show. So yeah, sure he could have I think that. he probably got what he wanted. And what's, what's weird okay. from our perspective is how, how uh, or it surprised me anyway, was the, the level of enthusiasm for those very small paintings on wood. And actually, uh, Barnes is quoted in a newspaper article after the show where he says, uh, um, you know, one of these new paintings will knock your eye out. The, the guy's got a whole new idea about color. Yeah, he comes back from Paris and he advertises. I mean, he really is. Yeah. I think, Joe, those would have been too big for him, though. I mean, on a level of practical of practicality, you know. Say that again. <laughs> well, no, but yes, but but we, but of course he's he's tries to sell the Riffian, right? I mean, he's and he's buying all these Nice period nudes and then sticking them up the top of all the ensembles. So, I mean, he do, he, buy, he buys the Vance period paintings. I mean, those are big, but I just have a sense. Those, I mean, among other things, those would have been too big for him. I mean, I, it's an interesting question. There, there is, to my knowledge, I mean, he goes to Paris and buys, what is it, four of them he comes back with? So I don't think he ever bought the, you know, thought of buying anything else, because he, he buys what he buys, and he's quite happy with it. So. So, it, I mean, is your point that they weren't for, I mean, what's your point? That they weren't for sale or something, or? No, uh, rather, his intention in all of those paintings was to make tapestries. Well, I mean, I would qualify that, like, I, because I, what, I have some reservations about uh, that idea just because, um, like, I looked at the contract that he had between, uh, with Marie Coutoli, who initiated the tapestry project, and the, the contract is very 
um, clear that, that the artist will be allowed to keep uh, the work that they want, and the work is referred to as a painting. Um, and you know, when it appears in the catalog, like it's not qualified as um, you know, a cartoon for a tapestry. Like the assumption is that it's just these are like, well, maybe it's All too correct. much of an assumption. All correct. <laughs> I, I, I it's true. You are going to, to forget that the first 81 was a, a very, Matisse was very despite because there is a mistake. And she was made as a tapestry, but on the wrong side. So, and Matisse absolutely don't want that this tapestry went to the state. Mm -hmm. And Marie Cotterly uh, don't heard, don't listen to Matisse and send it to the state. But Matisse don't want. Yeah. And after he decided to simplify with the Tate 82 yeah. to make a tapestry more easy to do. Yeah. And the third, the verdure was also a despite for Matisse because he never tried, he never finished this tapestry. And tapestry is very important for Matisse. He came from a, an area where uh, we practice textiles and his life is, his life is surrounded by tapestry. We, on all pictures, we see Moucharabier and so on and so on. So uh, Tahiti II was a tapestry. And it, take, it took a long time before uh, saying, no, finally, I don't want to make a tapestry because uh, with all the tapestry, in fact, it was despite. It was very despite with La Femme au Lutte also. Uh, and so he decided to never make any more a tapestry. So mm. he let this cartoon like a painting after. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think we can take one more question, and then we're going to take a break. Yes, please. Yes. I'm wondering, whenever I look at the dance, I think, I think of the dance in the Cone Collection down in Baltimore. And I'm wondering, I don't know if when each one of them was, was created to see if there was any connection between them. Has anyone done any analysis of the two works? Because they're very, in some ways, they're very similar. Wait, which which dance? ones? Um, I'm not, are you talking about the earlier versions of the dance? Um, the one that is where it almost looks like a circular that oh, dance. At MoMA? No, it's it's in Baltimore. It's part of the um, the Cone Sisters collection. And how? Well. No. I'm not I mean, yeah, I'm not. Sh I can't visualize the, the 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 specific dance that you're talking about. Okay. But um, you know, my my talk touched on Margaret's. I think also touched on like that. You know, Matisse had this great affection for his own work and a kind of fascination with what it became when it was done. That it kind of had a life of its own. Mm -hmm. um, and had the potential to be a source of inspiration for something else afterwards. So I think the replications of the dance kind of fit into that same scheme. Yeah, and I don't mean to point you to the catalog, but <laughs> and my own work. But there's a you know an essay on the dance mural in the book, right. which I mean I think he was most certainly influenced by his. Own his earlier work. I mean, he comes here. Of course, there's a dance in the Bonheur de Vivre, right? right? So he comes here in 1930, sees Bonheur de Vivre. He hasn't seen it in a long time. Mm -hmm. That dance is in the staircase. That dance is there. He makes the dance. Then we know he he's painting in Nice with, um, you know, a little charcoal drawing of the of the dance on the wall. So that is definitely that's a a repeated reference. OK, thank you. Um, we're going to take a 10-minute break. We'll meet back here at 345. <laughs>